The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Talo for lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin-Off. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spin-Off member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. You're listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab, offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops, and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. You're listening to Business Is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business Is Boring is made by The Spin-Off with help from Callaghan Innovation, New Zealand's innovation agency. Here's your host, Simon Pound. New Zealand honey is some pretty wondrous stuff. Many will be familiar with Manuka Honey's clinically proven qualities, but it doesn't stop there. Today's story is about a serial entrepreneur who turned a medical and research background into a clinically proven Kanuka honey product. When you hear that a product is all natural, yet as effective as a synthesized pharmaceutical product, you might find your skepticism rising, which is why today's guest went out and created a groundbreaking study recently reported in the British Medical Journal Open to prove his product's case. Utilising a network of pharmacies, Dr. Sean Holt got his Honeyvo cold sore gel, made from 90% Kanuka honey, into the hands of hundreds of cold sore sufferers. In a huge trial, they proved that their product was as effective as the market leader gold standard incumbent and tasted a lot nicer too. This success traces back quite a long way. Dr. Sean Holt is a trained pharmacist, doctor, successful author and a serial entrepreneur who started and exited a clinical research company and a research overview service before setting his sights on the pharmaceutical industry, where the spoils are large, but the costs of entry can be mind-boggling. To talk the journey, the many steps leading to today, and what's next, Dr. Sean Holt of HoneyLab joins us now. G'day, kia ora, good morning. Morning, Simon. Hey, thanks for coming in. Um, first up, let's go back quite a bit. Uh, into kind of what led you first to be interested in becoming a, a pharmacist and then into um, the medical life? Yeah, no, I was very good at science uh, when I was at school and pharmacy seemed uh, the next logical step. Interested in medicine, but didn't have the, uh, uh, the confidence to go into medicine itself. And uh, so I did pharmacy, enjoyed it. And then that was a great grounding to go into medicine. So I went straight from there to medical school. So some would say it was an excuse to do eight years as a student, but uh, it was, uh, it's all come together nicely in the end. Eight years as a student is um, that's a huge commitment and time period after having you know scrimped and saved and, and lived and, and worked hard as a student to get your pharmacy degree to jump straight back into medicine is quite a big call. It's good, though, because, you know, in America, you have to do a degree first, I think. And so uh, I really enjoyed it because you learn study skills. And then when I went into medicine, you know, I did, I did pretty well. I mean, I'm not bragging top 5% of my year and some very bright people there. So it all worked out very nicely. And did that background in the pharmacy sector set you up to kind of uh, have have a a good appreciation of, I guess, the end use case of a lot of the stuff that happens when people come to see a doctor? Absolutely. It was never planned this way. But, you know, looking at what I'm doing now, which is making over-the-counter medicines, if you like, they're the domain of pharmacists and you add in the medicine and the science behind that. So it wasn't planned that way, but it couldn't have been planned any better, really. (laughs) And what was it like? I, I saw somewhere in an interview with you, that the first little while of being involved in the uh, NHS in the UK as a junior doctor is a pretty gruelling thing. Yeah, it was awful beyond words. Uh, we used to do literally 100-hour shifts. 
which you can't, you know, after five hours on the ward, you're exhausted and, uh, you know, potentially making mistakes. We used to used to work all day, all night, all day, all night over the weekend. I ended up collapsing on the wards once and it was just a case of getting through that year. It was made illegal. We were the last year to do that. I think it was limited to 60 hours after that, which is still ridiculous in my view. A 60-hour a, a shift. Yeah. So not a 60-hour work week, not yeah, yeah. a 100-hour work week, a, a shift. Yeah, sh- a shift. So you'd st- uh, we'd start at 7 o'clock on a Friday morning and you'd finish late in a Monday evening. And you may grab a couple of hours of, you know, disturbed sleep, or you may not. Um, it's, it's just, you know, a case of uh, survival. It was just a ridiculous way. Uh, when, you, when we were being, um, for all those hours, the cleaners would be being paid more than you as well. On the basis of the amount of time. Yeah, because the more you worked, the more the, 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 the weight went out. It ended up a couple of pounds an hour. So How could they think that it was going to get good health outcomes if you had junior doctors so people very fresh to the profession making yeah. big decisions yeah. in situations that uh, you know a lot of torture is based on the idea of breaking people's yeah. sleep and making them do difficult things yeah it was it's absolutely ridiculous and uh, you know around a quarter of doctors just leave straight after that including myself so uh, you know if you've spent several hundred thousand pounds training someone it is it is it is ridiculous and i think everyone acknowledges that now and so it's not as bad now is it but it's still um there's still a perennial issue here around junior doctors having to work shifts that are too long and uh, the conditions being less than uh, optimal as people say yeah yeah still tough but you know not as tough as it was in my day but it's much <laughs> and, and, it's, and, and that's the way it should be it's much improved and rightly so and so that experience meant that you had a fresh kind of medical degree and experience you had yeah. your pharmacy background and you'd had enough of the UK. So how did you end up in New Zealand? Well, I guess if you look on, on a map, you go from Sheffield Hospital and, and as far away as you can get would be Wellington, New Zealand. So, yeah, we took a couple of months off, uh, ended up in Wellington. And then I was offered a job in medical research. And I thought, well, that's uh, with my good friend, Professor Richard Beasley in Wellington uh, straight away. And I accepted on the spot. And I just thought, well, this would be a great way to use all my training. And if you look at the, you know, the medical researchers, they sort of, you know, don't get too stressed. They're going off to conferences. It looked like a nice uh, career. So I'm glad I went into it. Yet no patients, kind of. <laughs> well, you see them on the trial, but, you know, they're generally more healthy and well. And uh, um, uh, so, it's, yeah, it's more, more academic and less stressful. And it just suited me perfectly. And what's involved in this, uh, the, the, the area of uh, clinical research that you got into? Is, is it a matter of kind of... Um, uh, you know, studying the science of um, how people present, or is it more in the lab, under the microscope? What kind of work is involved yeah. there? So in those days, that was doing clinical trials. So drug companies would develop a product, and then they need people to test them in- independently. So, you know, we were a center. Usually in those trials, there'd be many centers around the world doing the trial, and you'd have to recruit 10 or 20 or 50 patients to take part. And then you apply the protocol to them. You put them through the trial. You gather the data and and really providing a service for them, and is that designing and implementing or no? It's just that, that, that was just standard. doing. So what I'm doing now, I'm doing the whole thing. But in those days, it was just doing the trial. So again, that was great learning about the details of doing clinical trials. Because as you can imagine, you know, this is how new medicines are developed. It has to be pretty rigorous. And after a couple of years of that, you thought, well, hang on, I can do this. Is, yeah. that, is that pretty much it? Yeah, so I never intended to go into business in a million years, but I was doing it for the university and they drove me crazy with their rules and regulations and bureaucracy. I'll give you one concrete example. So uh, in clinical trials, you need to see people and they need to volunteer and come in. And so I realized very quickly that the best time was the weekend because that's when people are off work or school. Uh, but the university wouldn't let us open the doors at the weekend. You know, someone didn't have the key and there was a regulation and things. And so just small things like that, you think, well, you can't operate uh, optimally. So I thought I might as well just go and do this myself. And so what was involved in setting up a clinical research company uh, in New Zealand? Yeah, well, I was pretty much the first, I think, uh, to do to do what I was doing. A uh, small, you know, a doctor going setting up his own uh, centre. And I just went and did it. So, um, you know, I'd been working for the drug companies for a couple of years. They knew me. They liked the work. So I just hired a couple of rooms in, uh, in downtown Wellington and set up shop. And um, Worked uh, the weekends? Oh, of course. Oh, uh, <laughs> li- literally uh, 364 days a year in, in those days. And, uh, and, and developed a, a business called P3 Research, doing clinical trials. And then you sold out of that. And yep. it's continued to grow, hasn't it? Yeah. It's, it's grown. So I sold it 2006. And they now have centers in... Uh, 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 Napier, I think, and Tauranga as well, and and it's great, you know. Uh, I'm I'm delighted to see them doing well and growing. What led you to sell out of that? 
had a very nice offer and had some other ideas. So the timing was right. So um, it was a great deal, I think, all round. And as I say, I'm delighted to see them doing well. Some people sell a business and they don't want it to do so well. <laughs> they think, you know, because that then shows how clever they are. And only, but I'm just the opposite, you know, the, the better it does, you know, I think it's fantastic. And then, so you've written a bunch of books along the way as well, haven't yeah. you? And have had another um, successful exit with a a business that um, sold kind of the, the Cliff's Notes on research papers. Is that right? Yeah, it was to solve a problem. So this was a, with, a, with a friend over, over a couple of coffees. And the problem with, with one problem doctors face, and all health professionals actually, is continuing medical education. So there are around 10,000 medical journals published every month. How, how the heck do you keep up with that when you're busy all day doing your, your job? And so we realized that there was a, a way to improve on this and basically making small free PDFs with email with a summary of the top 10 things that month. You could read it in 10 minutes, a bit of local commentary as well. And you know, so in you know, in just ten minutes or twenty or thirty, if you read two of the three of these things, you could be up to date with your education, which is one of the major stresses for health professionals. It was free for them, uh, and the business model was to take on uh, adverts from pharmaceutical companies, who were happy to support it because the doctors and the nurses loved it, uh, but they had no input into the content. It was totally independent. That's wonderful. So I guess what would happen is if you got the the summary of. 10 papers and there was one that was of particular interest you'd go yeah. and find it and track it down and read yeah. the whole thing and so it was kind of a, a surfacing mechanism as well as a keeping on top of the broad things Ex- exactly because you know you say you're into respiratory medicine you know it's really hard to read all 30 journals every month so uh, particularly for gps and pharmacists you know they have to be you know they're general workers they need to know bits about everything so it's particularly useful for them so yeah, so that was uh, that went from a concept in, in over coffee to actually starting and running the business and selling it in actually less than two years. And had you got a bit of a taste for companies and setting up and exiting by then? Oh yes, uh, and you know folders full of ideas, and uh, so you know there were great learning experiences for the big one. I mean, I think you know Honey Lab is going to be the big one. Um, I think it's going to be a, well, it is already a massive company and will be even bigger. So again, they're just just great learning experiences. And one last step before we jump into Honey Lab that's really interesting is uh, your your books, especially the one that kind of like um, was the home run around the idea of natural remedies that actually work. Yeah. T- tell me about kind of the genesis of, of that book. And, you know, I, I love this idea, you know, naturals become such a kind of uh, a cipher of a word. Yeah. People read into whatever they want. Yeah. Arsenic's natural. Exactly. <laughs> it doesn't exactly. mean you want to That's be a, chucking it I into use. everything. So, yeah, yeah. yeah t- tell us, tell us about your, your your journey into kind of like being interested in helping people understand about natural products. Yeah, well, I wasn't interested in the slightest, to be honest. And then, um, you know, like a lot of doctors still are, just very, very skeptical of the whole thing. But then, for the research review company, one of them was a natural health research. So I started reading all the journals and summarizing. I actually wrote that journal myself. And uh, I found there was a lot of nonsense out there, uh, but there was some some really good stuff hidden out, hidden in there. Um, things I could talk all day. You know, ginger, for example, we think that's an old wives' tale, but you know, there's a great study in America, 600 people for people with chemotherapy nausea, and it was as good as the drugs if you gave the correct dose. So little hidden gems like that. And so, um, so after writing that for a couple of years, I thought, well, actually, these uh, publications actually a pretty nice book. And put that out there. Got a publisher, um, uh, and uh, yeah, it was it was a, it was a bestseller. So uh, I'm really p- proud of that book. What What are some of the ones? So Ginger's a, a well known one. Yeah. W- was honey involved in that mix? Yeah. Is that part of your 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 path into being interested in local honey? Yeah, honey was there, and um, you know things like St John's Wort for depression. There's some great evidence. Fish oil for for for, for reducing your cholesterol and your blood pressure. Uh, it, non-pharmacological things like you know meditation, mm-hmm. yoga, um, also talked about cannabis at the time, which is topical now. So, yeah, probably around only five percent of these natural therapies have good evidence that they work in the safe. And so, you know, that's a lot that don't. Ninety-five percent don't. But when you think there's hundreds of these things, you know, five percent is actually quite a few. And when so much media coverage or things that hit the mainstream can be based on some pretty dubious. Uh, you, you know, the odd outlier or, or some very yeah. poorly researched uh, findings. 
uh, very important to be able to take a, um, a a kind of scientific view on it. And this is what I did. And so, uh, again, <laughs> a lot of accidents to talk into your thinking about it. But yes, I've become known to the media as the go-to person to comment on these things. So I'm particularly known for criticizing things like homeopathy, which of course is ridiculous, um, bleach solutions to cure your cancer, you know, all sorts of things. So I'm, I'm known as a a, a skeptic and you know pull no punches on these ridiculous and potentially dangerous things but also at the same time promoting ones we should be using more and uh, you know i sort of don't fit in any either camp a lot of um, scientists think the whole natural thing is all crazy a lot of the natural people they hate all the all, all the medicines so I, I just sit in the middle you know this works this doesn't work and how do you decide you look at the science it's really really obvious to me and in terms of like paint, paint me a picture of how it was that you came with kind of this experience, this this growth of interest in kind of uh, because consumers are so interested in things yeah. that are natural, aren't they? Whether it's it's right or wrong, yeah. people seem to trust more things that they uh, can kind of see and understand rather than things that have been synthesized in a lab. Yeah. And and, and to tell me how the, that that kind of growing thing came to to get you to think. I'll tell you what, I'll start a pharmaceuticals company. Yeah, exactly, because more and more uh, consumers are wanting natural. You know, rightly or wrongly, they're wanting natural. Uh, you know, everyone knows that. And then I was just thinking, well, th some of these things are really good. Why does no one make uh, serious products out of them? Now, the reasons, of course, is that the, the main reason people say is, well, you can't protect, you can't patent it, you can't protect it. So if you do a load of research, other people just put the products out and you're not going to make any money. So... Uh, that's that is a is a potential barrier, but I thought there was uh, solutions to that. Yeah, so the aim of of Honey Lab when it started uh, was to start with honey, but then move on to other things. Was to uh, give great evidence to some of these natural things uh, that consumers are wanting and predicting that uh, that's what consumers would want more and more in the future. What led you to focus in on? I know that it's not just honey products, but honey's in the name there. What what led you to start with with honey? A single paper that uh, I'd been looking at all the natural products, and there's one, it was from Dubai, and it looked at uh, local Dubai honey, and it looked at it for herpes, both uh, cold sores which and, and genital herpes. It's the same herpes virus. It was only a small study, but it was it was pretty positive and quite exciting. And, you know, the mechanism seemed to be it was just healing the wounds, and that's what a lot of these things are. So look at cold sores. It's really just a wound. You know, you have a bit of a virus, and it, and it, and it erupts. But then after a few hours, it's just a wound that needs to heal. And we've known for centuries that honey heals wounds um, really well for various reasons. And so um, and being in the Bay of Plenty, which is, you know, a center for honey, I thought, well, this is the one we're going to start with. Let's let's see if we can turn this into a fully-fledged medical product. And Manuka honey has a lot of kind of uh, interest and also a lot of science behind it for yep. exactly those kind of yep. uh, uses for yep. healing wounds faster. Yep. What led you to Kanuka? Uh, because um, looking at the properties in a the laboratory, they're both great honeys. So obviously, Manuka, Kanuka are the two New Zealand tea trees. 99% uh, of Manuka, I think, is eaten, actually, and around 1% would go into wound dressings, and, and they're great products. Uh, but in the laboratory, Kanuka honey seemed to be equally as antimicrobial, uh, but also anti-inflammatory as well, and that's a key thing. So a lot, if you're going to use it as a skin medicine, then uh, reducing inflammation is often very important. So I just thought it was a better choice. And how did you go about? Uh, so, so from the paper of thinking, right, there's something interesting there. Yeah, I should have a look at the local uh, offerings to see if maybe we've got a, a honey that does the same job, and then I should find some kind of um, uses for it. Talk, talk me through. Talk me through how you actually start that. Yep, so uh, I've been looking at this and I was at a bit of a loose end and uh, I got an approach from a Wellington um, body, uh, I think it was a council, looking to, to grow biotech in the area. And, uh, and I said, well, I've got an idea, actually. I think, you know, honey could be done and I've got some ideas. And if you look at the, the, the what activity it has, you can think of certain conditions it might work for. So cold sores, acne, rosacea, eczema, um, things like that. And then the, um, so I was looking for some funding. So uh, we didn't get it, but the person involved, he instead funded it himself personally. And that was that was Lawrence uh, uh, Greg, and he he became my co-founder of Honey Lab. And so, cool. So you, you got in with a co-founder yep. and, and started researching. What did people tell you? Because you mentioned before that people say you can't take natural remedies yep. and make them into medicines because yep. you can't get patents. Yep. And that's kind of the conventional wisdom, isn't it? Yep. And that's what means that, 
there's a whole lot of research into things that people can own and a lot of things are kind of not researched and not looked into and not published if they are researched if people can't profit out of them yeah so that brings you to how do you protect you know the the, the investments in your work and in pharmaceuticals it's all about the patent because you have a patent on a molecule no one else can use that molecule for 20 years from when you or so from when you invent it but actually by the time it gets to the market which takes you know 10 12 years off and you've probably only got about eight years which is why the companies charge a lot of money they've got eight years to get all the money back and for all the many many failures along the way so it's not all about patent though so now we do have a patent that's great but it's not all about the patent so our patent was on the formulation and solving a problem so the problem with using honey to treat skin diseases is it gets rock hard in the winter and it gets really runny in the summer that's no good you can't have a a medical product that you don't know if you're going to be able to use it or not and so we tried a whole heap of things and eventually we found just some simple old glycerin at a low level uh, solve that problem so you can now put it in the freezer and it comes out absolutely fine and that was the basis of our patent but it's not just the patent so we have other other uh, protections as well so a big one is the supply chain so we've spent 10 years building up the supply chain to get quality honey of a certain standard uh, obviously it only comes from this country as well and you know we can produce hundreds of tons now which is what you would need if you want to make this product the number one product in the world for cold sores and rosacea which is what we want to do and then a third level of protection is you know everyone in business knows his trade secrets so you know you even if you took ours and put it in labs you wouldn't know exactly how we'd done it um, you wouldn't be able to reverse engineer our product exactly and our research our massive investment in research only applies to our specific product if you change anything at all you'd have to go and do your research again which takes years and years and costs millions of dollars so you've actually it's a long way to say we've got multiple layers of protection so that's why i don't buy that argument that you shouldn't develop natural products all of that sounds quite expensive and quite yeah. difficult yeah, yeah. which is the barrier to entry that uh you know the the uh, pharmaceutical companies love to keep up yeah. so to be able to make a claim, yep. any kind of firm claim that something works as well as or um, or even has any efficacy at all requires uh, a, a large study. Tell me about the interesting way that you went about finding a way to test your product against the market leader that people would normally get if they wandered into a pharmacy uh, with a cold sore that they wanted help with. Yeah, so, the, um, so we, uh, by this stage we'd already proven that it worked for rosacea which is a common condition and that tell, tell, tell me about rosacea sorry what's that yeah so rosacea is a condition that around five percent of people get particularly caucasian people it's a genetic uh, condition and you have a lot of redness around the nose and the cheeks so guys look like they probably drink a bit too much ladies spend a lot of time covering it up it's very, you ask any doctor it's very hard to treat they're usually on antibiotics for years and years and years and they don't really work that well is that when you look a little bit kind of windburnt the whole yeah, time? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, it's a bit more than that, actually. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, Bill Clinton, Princess Diana, all the royal family, Trump himself, you know, a lot of people have this and they uh, hide, try to hide it. So it's, you're not going to die from rosacea, of course not. But, you know, it's not nice to, to look in the mirror and people are looking at your red face. So we got so we had some great data, but that study only needed 140 people. And we did that through GPs and we trained up GPs uh, who did a great job. Now, for cold sores, without boring with the statistics, we needed 950 people. Now, that's huge. To put it in perspective, I think that's the biggest ever study um, done in New Zealand, even accounting for the pharmaceutical companies. It's about the third largest cold sores trial ever, including all the pharmaceutical companies. Now, the standard ways you get doctors uh, you know, in the, in the hospital or, uh, or at the university – uh, but the problem is they don't really see people with cold sores. You know, they sort of see more interesting and, and, and important things. Uh, and people with cold sores go to the pharmacy. So we said, well, actually, well, let's do it at the pharmacy. Because clinical research is all about finding the people and getting them on the trial, what we call recruitment. And so, yeah, we trained up. I say we. Uh, the study was all contracted out independently to the Medical Research Institute of New Zealand. But, you know, we, so we had input into the design and the setup and then just left them to it. And they got 75 pharmacists throughout the country who did the study. So, you know, again, I don't think that's ever been done before. Uh, we were able to do it in, t in about two years, which is just ridiculously quick. And for a fraction of the normal cost, you know, these trials would normally cost tens of millions of dollars. And, you know, we didn't spend that. So we made these pharmacists um, clinical research and they loved it. You know, it was something different. Uh, it was great for the patients. So if someone came in with a cold sore, uh, the pharmacist would say, hey, you can buy your product, your, your, your acyclovir cream. Or you can take part in the research. And if you take part in the research, you'll either have that 
or this new honey product that's being tested and uh, you just need to give us uh, feedback and, and monitor it and we'll, we'll give you 20 bucks for your time as well and it, it worked beautifully and so in theory they wouldn't have known whether they got the uh the current market leader product no they did or your honey or no. but but surely it would taste like honey if no, it's no, 90% no, they, they, honey yeah, yeah. They, they know what they're getting yeah, yeah, so it yeah. wasn't a blinded study yeah, for yeah, that reason yeah, yeah. so but that doesn't invalidate the study because they were mm. randomized mm. as to you know so they didn't know which one they were going to get but after that yes it was it's what's called open label yep. so you're right you know in an ideal world they would be blinded but you know it doesn't invalidate research if it's not it's just something you bear in mind mm. And so, and then they report on what? What do they report on? Well, that was novel as well. So they reported in by text message every day, uh, or if they didn't have a phone, they could actually write it on paper and post it in. So basically, uh, they had to report on the uh, the stage of the cold sore and the pain that they had suffered. And you might think, well, that's not very accurate, but it is. So we gave them a colour picture, and there's actually seven distinct stages of a cold sore, and it's really easy to look at your cold sore and look at the look at the picture and say oh yeah it's that one and and so you give it a number from one to seven every day and if you did it you know seeing a doctor every day that's all they would do as well so uh, and people might say oh well you know you use pharmacists and you didn't spend millions and millions of dollars is it great research uh, but you know the answer is i can answer it in two ways it is because it's been published in one of the top medical journals in the world the british medical journal open and secondly, we're in, a, in advanced discussions with pharmaceutical companies who want to take this product uh, and take it global. And so it, it uh, performed as well as the market leader cream. Yep. Did you have a, a third group of people who had no treatment as well to find out? So it was kind of eight to nine days that it helped people get through the cycle. Yep. How long does the cycle take without any intervention? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, the, the answer is I would have loved to have done that, to have a placebo group. And of course, we could have gone against just against placebo. And we, um, you know, we would have found a difference, but we were more ambitious. We thought, let's compare it to the market leader, uh, the gold standard treatment. Um, so yeah, cold sores last for around eight to ten days. Uh, you do, you, nothing gives a massive reduction in the duration. You know, you're talking maybe half a day or a day of duration, um, which which is useful. You know, if, uh, you, you want it gone as quickly as possible. But it's also the pain's really important as well. So I don't know if you get cold sores. One in three people on the planet get cold sores. Uh, what happens is they dry up and they crack and it's really painful your lips very very sensitive so to have something like honey which is soothing and moisturizing that you can keep putting on uh, really helps so it's it's the pain as much as the the, the duration and to answer sorry, your specific question and yeah this has been some of the criticism out there so ah yeah well both of them don't work haha <laughs> because you are the same uh, but no that's not true because uh, what we compared against acyclovir there's many many studies proven that it works it's fda approved so you know it's it's logic 101 if that one shortens the duration and we're exactly the same as that then clearly we reduce the duration and one in three people that's a pretty big market <laughs> one third of anyone with lips yeah so you know and people say to me you know oh you know should you not be seeing patients in your clinic all day and uh, and helping people that way with all your training i say well i could you know and if i did that over a lifetime i'd see a couple of thousand people and be able to help them maybe and that'd be great but you know if i can invent something which is arguably the best treatment for cold sores that one in three people get that is arguably helping people even more how did you go about building up that research as well? And and I imagine ahead of revenue, because there'd be some revenue coming in, but not the kind of revenue that maybe uh, strictly justifies uh, contracting uh, the, the, the gold standard of people to run trials for you. Yeah, so uh, raising money has been a, a constant issue. I think we've got one more round to do, and then, uh, and then thank goodness, I think we'll be beyond that. Uh, we, did, we did the classic thing, family and friends to start with, and then some... Uh, people who knew investors, and we've had one institutional investor. But you don't go all in on a massive study straight away. So uh, what you do is you start with what's called a phase two study. Um, well, if you're a non-natural product, you start with a phase one study, which is first time into human beings. So obviously we don't need to do that. You know, We know honey is intrinsically safe. So a phase two study is a small study with 10 or 15 people just to see if there's anything, any sort of signal that it's worth developing. You know, if there's nothing going on, you can kill it at that stage. If it seems to be promising, then you would then invest in a big trial. Um, so, so you know, we raised money initially for the phase uh, two studies and rosacea, uh, acne and cold sores passed that and other ones didn't do. And then we progressed, then we raised more money and put those into the phase three trials. And how did Callaghan Innovation help with the research process? Oh, they've been great. You know, I've had a long relationship. They've been great for many years. Um, 
uh, in contacts and advice and all sorts of things, but particularly helping to fund, you know, p- part of the clinical trial. You know, that was huge. It really accelerated it and gave us the confidence to put all our money into that trial. And now that it's come, well, you know, it's been a couple of years in the making and now yeah. it's been reported and, and it's out there. What are the next steps? There's a there's a big world out there, isn't there, of people with cold sores? Yeah, so the plan from day one, from 10 years ago, was to license the product. It wasn't to build it and make a brand ourselves. I know nothing about branding. I'm not interested in that. For me, it was it was to make a product and license it to uh, someone like, you know, a huge pharmaceutical company. And it could be one or more. It could be uh, someone in one country or it could be someone who's global. And then they can use their massive marketing power to sell it. So it's a licensing model, uh, which I've been a believer in and all our company has from day one. Not the investors, I have to say. They've uh, Very few of them believe in that model. Um, we are in advanced discussions now with several companies. I'm hoping you know we'll, we'll make some announcements and we'll be vindicated. In terms of that investment, did you have to go overseas to find it? Like, was, was there kind of the the um, experience and belief in a New Zealand product here? Uh, no, um, we haven't been overseas just because you know we're a tiny company. We don't have the contacts overseas. We, we, we've we've just about managed to raise enough, but it's a constant. Uh, you know, I probably spend half my time raising money, which is you know frustrating because I'd rather spend that half time developing new products. I've got many many products I want to develop in a similar way. Uh, so yeah, we, we found it very very difficult. Uh, I don't want to be critical of people in New Zealand but everyone says you know overseas you, you, what we're doing will be much more uh, valued and uh, investable uh, but investors don't seem to like the licensing model we explain it and how you know you can get massive returns if you're the number one product in the world and you're getting a, a big royalty and a big signing on fee how the returns are, can be exponentially bigger than building your own brand and a lot quicker as well and they sort of seem to get it but then they'll look at our tiny tiny sales in New Zealand and, and they'll run a mile so other than Keyside uh, uh, who, who invested in our institutional you know most people just don't get it. What are the other products you've got in the pipeline? Yep so uh, I can tell you the next one which has started clinical trials and that's Carnuka Oil. So we're working with Hikarangi Enterprises on the east coast who are producing the oil and it, again it's just like honey it's got some great properties you know in theory it should be great for eczema and acne for example. And I think those are uh, conditions the world does need better products for. And we've started phase two clinical trials for those. Uh, and then I can't tell you that, that what the next ones are, but, you know, they're all sort of sustainable New Zealand natural resources. But the Carnuka is wonderful, you know, and it's also sustainable. We can get the uh, honey from, from the trees and we can also a couple of times a year strip the leaves and the, and the small branches, boil it up, get the oil off, and they just grow back again. So it's all sustainable and we can get two different products from it. That's so remarkable to go straight to the source and cut out the bee middleman. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, v- very hopeful for Carnuka Oil, and as I say, lots more uh, coming along as well. I've seen on your website as well you've got um, bee venom and some kind of uh, a- anti-aging or a- age-alleviating kind of things. What, what's what's the kind of um, possibilities around skincare and topical skincare? Yeah, so we have a uh, bee venom products. You know, we have bees, so we can we can easily extract the venom without killing them. I must add, we have a. I won't get into the technicalities, and uh, so yeah, we, we've got a, there's there's many. I mean, I didn't go to uh, to medical school to invent a skin cream for anti aging, but we, but you know we have done. You know, there's other bee venom cosmetics out there. The only difference with us is we've done studies. We've done studies and published studies, so it does actually work. You put it on and you get about a 12 hour, very very mild swelling, which sort of irons out those wrinkles and uh, particularly around the eyes and the forehead, and also plumps up the lips as well. Would you would you believe? Which apparently is a, is a big thing. Uh, that, and that was a fun side project, but more seriously on bee venom, what really excites me is is arthritis and musculoskeletal pain. So if you look on YouTube, you'll see the traditional Chinese uh, therapy of getting live bees and stinging your joints. And that kills the bee. And you might do it five or six times on each joint. And it's incredibly painful. It's a bee sting every time. So you, so you might think, well, why the hell would anyone consider doing that? And the reason they do it is because it works. And we know how. Uh, you get local release of steroid in, into your joint. So it's like a rugby player having a, a, a steroid shot to get back on the pitch a bit earlier. And so that you get relief for six, eight, ten weeks from these bee stings. And that's why it's called AP therapy. And that's what people do. So we've developed a cream with that in as well. Actually, we've combined it with another great natural product called capsaicin, which is from chili peppers. It gives you the heat in chili peppers. That's already been proven to work for musculoskeletal pain. 
the two of them should work beautifully together. So we've got that product out there. Tragically, I haven't had enough funds at this stage to do the big clinical trial I want to do, but I'm very confident on that product. What's the path for you now? So to license out the one that you've got the strong research yep. behind yep. and then keep developing these things? Yeah, absolutely. So the same model, um, we've got a whole heap of ones and people are bringing stuff to us, you know, they, they've got this natural product and they don't they don't know about how to approach drug companies and licensing. And it is very hard, you know, it's taken us 10 years to, to learn all these skills. The regulatory work, you know, putting in FDA applications, you know, it's not easy stuff. Uh, so yeah, we've just got many, many more and I just want to keep making new products that help people. Along the way, I imagine quite a few people have told you uh, that it might not have been the brightest idea to take on Big Pharma, to work with natural products, to do it fr from New Zealand with little known, um, little known products. You know, I imagine working with a, a honey that was known overseas would have been a, an easier path. Like, yeah, how does it feel to have got to a stage where it's been vindicated yeah i think we're very close to and i think you know when we get our first licensing deals we will definitely be vindicated we already are in terms of the proving the products work and so yeah you would say uh, you're pretty crazy or arrogant or or both to take on the pharmaceutical companies but look pharmaceutical companies they're running out of drugs to invent the number of drugs coming through is, is plummeting they also are very very aware that consumers are wanting natural products and they don't like their synthetic ones on the whole but they're just unable to do what we're doing. They're, they're, they're just, you know, they've got a hundred year history of just developing a single molecule, patented it, and, and developing it and, and then charging high prices. And I, and I think, I, I mean, you know, with all the arrogance uh, in, in the world, I think our model is, is potentially better. If you look at their model, they'll find a chemical in a test tube and then they'll put it in animal, and then they'll get the patent at that stage and uh, then they'll put it in animals and it'll probably fail at that stage. And then if it doesn't, they'll put it in a few people and it'll probably fail at that stage. And then a few more people, it's likely to fail. And then they'll do eventually a big trial and it may or may not succeed. And then they'll try and get it FDA approved, which may or may not. And when you look at all the odds of failure, probably around 1% get there. So when they have one that works, they've, got a, they've only got a short bit of patent left. They've got to charge a fortune to, to recoup all that and all the ones that have failed and make enough money for the next ones coming along. I think it's a, and this is why so many of them struggle and go out of business. Our model's different. So we're starting with a natural product that generally has been already used by ma many people for many years. So it's probably gonna be work and it's probably gonna work and it's probably gonna be safe. Not guaranteed, but rather than likely to fail, it's likely to pass phase two, it's likely to pass phase three. You don't even need FDA approval. It's great because then you can make stronger claims and you can probably sell more. Uh, but you don't even need it. You can just sell it as it is anyway. So I, th I think our model is potentially better. What advice would you have for people who are interested in taking uh, a product they really believe in and, and building a strong case for it and making a business around it? Absolutely go for it. Um, you know, if it's in the medical field, it is very specialized. You're probably going to have to partner with people. You know, I mean, I've got 20 years of background doing this sort of stuff. It is very hard. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You know, if you've got a medical product, if you can show it works, if you can protect it, you know, I think the the, the, the sky's the limit. And having uh, had, you know, a lot of people um, would be pretty happy to become pharmacists and a lot of people would be very happy to become a doctor and a lot of people would be happy to start a successful business yeah. or or three. You know, having, having had a, a best-selling book, having had success across these different fields, you know, what, what, what drives you? What, what, how do you define that success and what keeps you going? Yeah, a lot of failures, but we, you know, we've got time in the podcast to go into all those. Not all success, but, uh, but yeah, um, what's success? Look, there's different things. Um, uh, in terms of starting businesses, you know, you're creating jobs and paying taxes. I think that's a wonderful thing. I honestly think people who start businesses are heroes. I really do. I think that's one thing. Um, secondly, you've got success from, from helping people with medical conditions, you know. If we can help their arthritis, their rosacea, their cold sores, their acne, their eczema, uh, help their quality of life, um, maybe come off some of the pharmaceutical products with side effects, uh, you know, for cold sores, help one in three people on the planet, that's, that's really good. And I guess the other one in terms of business, I mean, you know, there's hard metrics of business, you know, what's the value, what's the value of the business, what's the, what's the profit of the business. So I think you've got various ways you can look at it. And what's your personal measure of success? 
All, all of the above. <laughs> Great. Well, so thank you so much, Dr. Sean Holt, for coming and sharing the story of Honey Lamb and, uh, and Honey Bow. The, the actual cold sore gel is, is already on the market and available now, isn't it? Yeah, it's on the sh- stores, uh, in, in the, in, on the shelves in the pharmacies. Yep. Yeah, and uh, lots more to look forward to soon. Great. Thanks very much, Simon. Hey, thanks so much for coming and sharing your story. Thank you to Tina Tiller for producing. And thank you very much for having us along and listening. You've been listening to Business is Boring, presented by Simon Pound. And brought to you by The Spin-Off and Callahan Innovation. From the Spin-Off Podcast Network, that was Business is Boring, brought to you by SparkLab. Make sure you're following Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on SparkLab, visit sparklab.co.nz. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.